Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the Spy Cops case. This is a scandalous situation that unfolded in Britain over the course of decades. Undercover police officers were sent to investigate political organizations. They pretended to be activists. Some of them even had children with the people that they were surveilling. Since 2015, a major public inquiry has been underway looking at the Spy Cops case. And today we're very happy to welcome Tom Fowler, who is the mind behind the Spy Cops Info podcast. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. No worries. Thanks for having me, comrades. Um, so Tom has been attending basically every second of the public inquiry. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, apart from a funeral, uh, yeah, I've been to everything. So not unreasonable to say that you're one of the better informed people in the country when it comes to the Spy Cops case. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know more than it's good for my sanity. Um, I work very closely with the Undercover Research Group. Um, I would say they probably uh, they probably have a better handle on it than me because... They read all the disclosure. Um, there's a huge, huge amount of detail. Um, huge numbers of PDF files are released by the inquiry. Pretty usually, I mean, like at first, it was like at the same time as they interviewed somebody. Now they're very behind, and it sometimes it takes a while for the documents to come out. But you know, for every for every witness that they uh, they question, there's literally hundreds of documents that are released as well. So um, right, yeah, I mean, I've got an overview of it. I don't read everything. I, I mean, I, I find it crazy that some people manage to do that, but. There's a lot of lawyers and a lot of uh, researchers who are following this who do really do that. Well, I mean, I've been listening to some of the episodes of the Spy Cops Info podcast, which I recommend, and I'll put a link in the description of this episode where people can go have a listen to their preferred platform. I mean, we did cover this case on our British website, uh, nowcommunist.red, um, when it was in the news. And we also covered the related practice of blacklisting, which we'll talk about as well. Um, it's just such a sickening, sickening case. I mean, the human impact, the lives ruined and just the cold hearted and dirty tactics of the British state really exposed and also the collusion to the highest levels. We'll get into all of that. But before we do, I'm going to introduce my other guest who you'll recognize if you've watched previous episodes of the Spectre of Communism podcast. It's Jorge Martin, who is a member of the editorial team for Marxist.com and also a member of the International Secretariat of the Revolutionary Communist International. So, Jorge, thank you so much for joining us once again. Yeah, thank, um, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing what uh, more about this case. Yeah, yeah and uh, Jorge also has some interesting um, direct connections to, or I should say, some interesting anecdotes about people associated with the Spy Cops case, which he'll get into later on. But, Tom, I'm going to start with you first. Um, Possibly, this is an international show, and not everybody listening will be from Britain, even though this news did get around the world. Could you give everyone a quick update, a quick refresher on the details of this case, what actually happened, and why is it so scandalous? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, firstly, I would say that, you know, the state has, you know, the state uses many different forms of repression, and the use of undercover officers is a very long-standing old practice. But when we're talking about um, spy cops, as a, as a concept, generally we're talking about two units, uh, the Special Demonstration Squad and the National Public Order Intelligence Unit, both Metropolitan Police Units. Uh, the SDS um, were uh, founded in 1969, um, so in 68, uh, following the, um, uh, so, so, supposedly because the police lost control of an anti-Vietnam War demonstration that happened in the March of that year. Um, famously, the, uh, the, the crowds almost got inside the US Embassy um, and there was supp supposedly, I mean, I, you might find out I'm couching a lot of the things when I, when I give the history of the unit, there's a lot of supposeds and alleged because we are dealing with professional liars, um, mm. and they've created their own mythology uh, around how the unit operates, but we kind of get the impression that, you know, it, it, that there's a certain truth to it. The, the unit was set up in the aftermath of, of that demonstration, and it was initially a tasked with, disrupting the movement um, to the point where the October national demonstration that was planned would not be a public order incident in the right. same way as the first one was. 
So mm -hmm. supposedly that's why the unit is formed. But very quickly, um, once that's achieved, the unit doesn't disband um, as some of the officers involved with it expect it to, and it carries on. Uh, and it becomes a an instrument being used by a British special branch. So these are the already the political police um, to target uh, anybody really on the left. Um, they start off after this Vietnam anti-Vietnam war, war movement. Then it's the uh, anti-apartheid movement, uh, anti-racists. Um, pretty much anybody on the left was mobilizing. Uh, I mean, some actually who aren't even mobilizing. I mean, they targeted uh, groups like the Independent Labour Party, um, who you know, I mean, may have attended the occasional demonstration, but certainly were never yeah. involved. Not, in particular, not particularly or... radical or uh, particularly left wing in the grand scheme of things. I mean, not really not. I mean. It, there's a very low bar. I mean, some of the, um, so, I mean, for example, they, they, one of the early groups they infiltrated was uh, the Women's Liberation Front. And I mean, I don't think there's anything that even the most liberal person would disagree with in the programme of the Women's Liberation Front. They were demanding that women should have, like, bank accounts mm -hmm. <laughs> and that rape within marriage should be illegal. Um, you know, these incredibly uh, low level of, uh, of a bar for who got infiltrated. Can I ask as well, was there a comparable level of state interference, uh, infiltration, repression of right-wing groups, far-right groups like the National Front and this sort of thing? I mean, absolutely not. I mean, completely missing. Uh, during the beginning of the first uh, tranche of the inquiry uh, covering the 1970s, we heard a lot of evidence from former undercover officers who had infiltrated left-wing groups and anti-racist groups. And th that was put to them, you know, uh, there was no officers infiltrating the far right during the 70s. Um, why was that? And they were very clear about it. The National Front were not a problem. Um, right. they, the National Front were uh, communicating with the police about their plans for demonstrations. It was the anti-racists who were right. attacking them that were the right. problem. As far so, as so, so basically the left were the threat and the right were the snitches. <laughs> right. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, like from the from the political point of view of the state, um, you know, fascists are a, a useful mm -hmm tool right i mean i don't think that they're loyalists they believe in the queen they believe in britain you know i mean a lot of police officers were very sympathetic to them now mm. very recently we just we've been looking at the the 1980s uh the inquiry and we had uh the first um undercover officer who infiltrated the far right uh, hn 56 now just to get just to sort of like just these undercover officers were set in deployments for between four and five years mm. um they went deeply into target groups of active political campaigners and they infiltrated the very lives of the people that they were uh, infiltrating. They took the identities of a dead child to build their um, their legend. And then they would often engage in quite intimate, long-term sexual relationships with women within those groups in order to ingratiate themselves with the rest of the group, build their legend and be, um, be able to access more information than they would otherwise. Right. Now, HN56 infiltrated the far right. He infiltrated a moribund group of the BNP uh, in somewhere in, in North London. I forget the name of the area. I'm not very good in London uh, geography. But uh, he was there for 10 months. The, the group was moribund. So he's just going along to a local pub where he knew that the members of the BNP happened to drink, where he read a copy of The Times. He went there three, four days a week and drank heavily, um, socialized with them a bit. He went yeah. to um, one meeting. Uh, attended one Rights for Whites march and then withdrew. Um, he claimed he withdrew early. Um, he withdrew immediately. He didn't have the, they, they had a very complex withdrawal method, which was very similar. I can get onto that later if you like. Sure. Um, he withdrew almost just on, on a whim. Uh, he said he was terrified that other uh, members of the SDS were going to um, expose his deployment because so many other uh, police officers were supportive of the politics of the VNP and didn't think it was right that there was an undercover officer in them. But his his infiltration was so shallow, so shallow. I mean, I've, I've seen his reports. There's very few of them. I mean, there's like three-month gaps between his reports. Most of these officers were, were putting in two reports a week. Um, he was leaving like two, three-month gaps. In his reports, they could have been gleaned just from reading the British Nationalist newspaper. Um, there was a little bit of gossip, but you know, very, very... You know, you chat, he's blatantly just chatting to some guys in a pub. He's clearly terrified going on the Rights for Whites march. Um, that that obviously had some, I think, had some sort of impact on his early withdrawal. But he's very concerned about the other officers being on his side. It it, it seems clear that there's obviously been some direction um, to the SDS management that they needed to infiltrate the far right um, just for some sort of tick box exercise. So they sent someone in. I mean, interestingly, this officer, somebody who had come in 
to uh, the police later in life, uh, which was quite unusual. Most of these, most of the SDS officers are career coppers who join the special branch and then get recruited into the special demonstration squad. He was slightly different, and it just seemed like, oh, we'll just get this guy, we'll send him into the BMP, it'll be fine, he won't actually do much. Um, right. That That is the extent. Now, according to the chair of the inquiry, there are other officers who did infiltrate far-right groups. Um, they have got, most of the undercover officers at the inquiry have got a cipher number. In, 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 in some cases, we know their cover names. In very rare cases, we know their real names. There's a handful of officers like that. There's a number of officers that have so secret, got such a level of restriction, order, and privacy, they have got don't even have a cipher. They don't have a HN number. So they only get referred to as another undercover officer when they're being referred to in evidence about another officer. So supposedly there were, um, it was one particular undercover officer who was uh, in the far right who had scared HN56 to the point where he withdrew. So supposedly there was some other infiltration, but we haven't heard anything about it yet. We can only assume that it's going to be at a similar level of what HM56 did, but we don't right. know. But the reality is the vast majority of the groups infiltrated were left-wing groups, political activist groups, anti-racist groups, and trade unions. Um, what were some of the groups that suffered from the most intensive surveillance? I mean, it's a mixture. Um, I mean, like when you talk about the most intensive surveillance, um, I mean, the, 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 the single organisation who had the most infiltration was the Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, well, the International Socialists and the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, partially that's because of the size and the longevity of the organisation. Um, but also, I think I, th I think one of the important things that we, we all uh, political activists should take from what we've learned about the spy cops is one of the reasons why the SWP was so heavily targeted was because of their use of lists. Um, mm -hmm. Because this is what um, the undercover officers were really after uh, was the, 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 they, a lot of their reports are just lists. It's like a name, an address, uh, physical appearance, uh, trade union uh, affiliation, uh, place of work, connections to other people. Uh, and it's that information which they're really sort of like putting together, um, uh, creating databases of people that could be possible in future informers, um, but more importantly, can be vetted. So at some point later in life, you know, should they decide, you know, some of the people got on these lists for very spurious reasons. I mean, if you if you bought the, a copy of a, a radical newspaper, um, if an undercover officer was in, in the group that sold you that paper, you were probably going to get followed home so that they could take note of your address so that you they could start to build up who you are so that you could go on these lists, which we used for vetting or what we would call blacklisting to ensure that that. The, anybody involved in radical politics okay. is finds a great difficulty in getting ahead or even getting a job in the civil service or the BBC or any position of influence really within British society. Right. Uh, and I think this is the bigger picture really of the whole topic. And I'd like to talk about that more specifically. And I was going to ask Jorge if you could come in on the question of blacklisting. So could you elaborate a bit more for listeners and viewers about the practice yeah. and how it's connected to this undercover surveillance by the police? I did, I did want to ask about this because as far as I understand, there is uh, an overlap. I, information that was gathered by the by, by these spy cops was then they ended up in the blacklist uh, uh, list. Uh, for, for our listeners, the blacklist... Um, existed for a very long period of time under different names. Uh, and it was at one point, uh, there was an, an organization which uh, gathered this information on behalf of the bosses, on behalf mm -hmm. of the employers, mainly in the construction industry, but also affecting other industries. And they, they gathered information about activists, trade union activists, troublemakers, P people will go on a site and try to enforce Health and safety, for instance, you know, that's a dangerous thing for, yeah. for the employers. So they had a list of people who had been involved in different times in these questions. And they will be uh, prevented from working on sites. I know I know a, a comrade who joined, uh, was employed at the site, at the, the Olympic site, when, when they were building the Olympic site. And, they, uh, and he, he got on his job on a Friday. By Monday, he was sacked. And the reason is because the employer then checked his name against this uh, list. Uh, th th this was a whole organization. I, the employers paid a subscription to this uh, organization gathering information. And they paid also a fee for every uh, uh, inquiry they made about one single uh, individual. 
And so he, by Monday, he'd lost his uh, job. And then many people were, were unable to work on any building sites across the country for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find interesting, uh, maybe you can talk more about this, is, is how come the information gathered by the Secret Service, by the Special Demonstration Squad and other people uh, that has been revealed during this inquiry. How is it possible that information from this uh, ga gathered through this means ended up in the list of a private organization set up by the by the employers? Uh, because we know that information that, that built up the blacklist came from uh, trade union officials, uh, came from the police, came from the employers themselves. Um, but, but this. This should be technically illegal, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the police gathering information for themselves, not necessarily technically to, to pass it on to the employers, is it? It's all my yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Consulting Association and its predecessor, the Economic League, which are the organisations you're talking about, absolutely had a, an incredibly close um, relationship with uh, the police. Um, we, we've uh, seen construction workers who were blacklisted when once they when they found their files. Um, there's a really good book by um, Dave Smith, uh, the blacklist, um, well worth reading, which kind of explains how they managed to get some of those files. Um, and I'm, I mean, really, the, the reason why the construction industry is is so well known for this, though. It, there have been there have been whispers of a of the blacklist on building sites for years. I mean, partially because of the casualized nature of of the construction industry, um, it is a lot easier for employers to chuck people off jobs uh, quite easily. Um, but so they've been talked about for years. But from what we can tell, it just seems like this is the one that just got exposed. Um, when the consulting association was raided, they took one um, one filing cabinet, which included the construction blacklist. I mean, there was a whole office of, of cabinets. It, it appears it exists across all sorts of different um, different industries. I mean, we hear of the not, um, the the NNN register, not needed back, NNB register, not needed back, um, which was used uh, in the oil rigs. But there's lots of other industries appear to have them as well. And yeah, those the, those files um, you, you would have in, in the information about them being a, a problem when it came to health and safety, which was just doing your job properly, right? Um, but also then, you know, people talked about their their files, including information about their anti-fascist work or um, you know involvement in in uh, in left wing activity of various kinds. But it just appears that. You know, there was a quid, a quid pro quo um, relationship between Special Branch and the likes of the Consulting Association and the Economic League, where they were passing information back and forth that they found useful. Um, you know, when we um, when we look at what, like, kind of who really, like, ru who runs these units, um, it as much as it, there is a there's a human hierarchy, of course, it's the regist registry files, um, which are the, are the basically the, the the secret files that the, the state has on every has on people that they think are of interest and you know the, the special branch are looking in any way possible to add to those registry files so that would include talking to private businesses like the consulting association who maintained these databases basically if you had a list of a database that the special branch was interested in you if you're on the left you're getting infiltrated so they can steal that database if you're you know if you're a corporation or something well they know there's a business relationship they can have with you about it Mm. I mean, we as communists talk about capitalist and state interests being intertwined by a thousand threads. And I think this is a very concrete example of exactly mm. that. The state using its powers to spy mm. on people for their political activity mm. and feeding that information to the bosses to basically intimidate and starve them out of work. Mm. Um, I mean, like also, I mean, it's, oh. it's very much you know, when so many um, former undercover officers go into private security work right. um, in the corporate sector. And I mean, that includes the likes of the blacklisters, you know. Of course. Oh, hey, sorry, you're going to jump in. Yeah, there's something else I wanted to ask you by reading this uh, report about the spy cops inquiry. Uh, it's not just an element of uh, looking for information, gathering information. I isn't it the case that some of these officers that were undercover in these organizations went on to become officers or, or have positions of responsibility in these organizations, even to a high uh, uh, level? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, in some, I mean, like it was very common for them to become like uh, treasurers, um, you know, uh, or secretaries, uh, basically getting the access to those membership lists. That 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 seemed to be, and it was quite common for um, even you know quite early on in their deployments to to get into those sorts of positions. But when we look at like to the, the more hierarchical organisations, um, yeah, I mean, some of them you know really like uh, worked their way up. 
Um, I mean, the first example was a, a guy called Rick Gibson, um, who infiltrated the Troops Act movement uh, in the 1970s. Troops Act movement was a very broad based uh, campaign. Uh, it, it got called an Irish Republican support group. I mean, it, re it really wasn't. Um, it was just a, a broad based campaign that was against the deployment of um, soldiers in Northern Ireland. Uh, it was, you know, supported by lots of like priests and vicars and things. Do you know what I mean? It was a very broad based organization. I mean, he ended up as a national convener. Um, after setting up a, a spurious branch in the area he was deployed, because there wasn't one, so he set one up and was became the secretary of that. He he, he quickly became the, the 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 London convener and ended up the national convener. You know, you, essentially, you've got an entire campaign being run by special branch, yeah, which I mean, so just have, I mean, it just have... shows when we talk about fake opposition and stuff. I mean, you couldn't get more. Mm. So you have police officers really in positions of responsibility mm. making decisions. I would say in some cases, even perhaps inciting people to do certain things which will then be used against them, a, a things that might be illegal or something like this. I think about I the mean, case, I think about the case of Carlo Neri, who infiltrated mm -hmm. the Socialist Party, and he has been revealed that he was trying to incite trade unionists to firebomb a charity mm -hmm. shop in North London. Mm. who alleged that he said was run by an Italian fascist. So basically, this is a police officer trying to mm. get two trade unionists to commit uh, arson, a criminal act, mm. which then they, they will be uh, done for, mm. basically. Mm. Well, Jorge, didn't you know or know someone who knew uh, Spike? Yeah, I actually met uh, uh, Carlo Neri during the... It was actually Carlo, Carlo Neri. Yeah, yeah. Um, just, I mean, it was his cover name was Carlo Neri. Uh, yes. uh, Carlo Sorocci is his yes. uh, his real name. That's right. So this this guy was involved um, in the campaign against the victimization of Steve Hadley, who was working in the um, in the St Pancras in the in the Eurostar uh, site, and he was sacked for some some toolbox gone missing. It was used as an excuse to sack him for his trade union activity. There was a there was a rank and file campaign. And I was involved in leafleting with him and other people. And Carlo Neri was active there. And a friend of mine, comrade, uh, he was befriended by this Carlo Siracci. That's that his real mm. name. And um, yeah, basically. Uh, and this same guy then tried to incite, as I say, uh, a number of trade unionists to firebomb this, this place. And, and the false pretenses, uh, are you trying to incite people? And this is entrapment, isn't it? Uh, inciting people to commit an illegal act uh, do, done by a police officer. I mean, this is complete uh, scandal. Mm. And what, what was he like, uh, Carlos Neri, um, Sochi, whatever? Oh, he was, he, was a, he was a big, big fella. Uh, he, he played his Italian background and he was interested in Italian music. This friend of mine, Ramon from Spain as well, he was interested in Italian radical music. That's how they got um, talking. And that's yeah. mm. fan of ska mm. music, he said, wasn't he? Sorry? F fan of ska music. Yeah, that's yeah, right. that's right. That should have been a red flag from the beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> I might edit that out. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, um, but on the very. I mean, yeah, so, I mean, it, 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 yes, uh, Sirachi, I mean, definitely. Um... Yeah, I mean, that, a, a real textbook example of like um, agent provocateur activity. And certainly like a lot of the other officers, one of the things that a lot of them had in common is they had a van. They, yeah, they happened right. to own a van or, yeah. a, or a large vehicle that they yeah. were willing to drive people around. Very with. helpful. Very helpful. Very helpful. Very uh, essential, really, to a lot of small groups, particularly uh, direct action groups. And a lot of the direct action wouldn't have happened if they didn't have of a van and a driver to to take people there. So, you know, on a, on a very basic level, you know, a lot of activity wouldn't have happened without that. But I would say that, um, like, my personal experience of being infiltrated in my group, South Wales Anarchists, um, and a lot of other people have said a similar thing, it's that the, the influence from the undercover officer wasn't necessarily that of provoking to, to take action, but rather the opposite. Um, we were quite an active group when he infiltrated us. We were taking quite regular direct action. Um, by the time he left, we were a lot less engaged with that. Um, I mean, I really felt that I, I went from the front to the back of the demonstrations during my time of knowing Marco Jacobs, uh, who was the undercover officer in our group. Um, so sometimes they had like they, had, they would have the, the dampening effect. I'd like to get back to the human impact of the spy cops case. Um, I think that the scandal came to the attention of most people. It came to the attention of the mainstream press, sort of 2010, 2011. My understanding is that some of the spy cops started getting cold feet and went to the press. Is that right? 
So there was one officer, Peter Francis, um, who did an interview uh, with The Observer. Um, and he's since gone on. Um, I, mean, I, I see him quite regularly at the inquiry. Um, he infiltrated um, Youth Against Racism in Europe, uh, which was the anti-racist group associated with the um, militant Socialist Party. Um, uh, yeah, and he he gave this um, this interview where he explained the unit, explained that how the deployment worked, how the withdrawal worked, and um, a lot of people, uh, including ourselves in South Wales, kind of read that and were like, mm, "That sounds a lot like this person who's disappeared from our group that we've got some nagging questions about." Um, but it was much worse for people in Nottingham. Um, the undercover cop in their group was still there at the time. Um, they knew him as Mark Stone. Uh, we now know him as Mark Kennedy. Yes. Um, it turned out he, I mean, he, they'd known him for seven years. Now, these deployments only lasted for five normally. It turned out that at the end of his five-year deployment, he, um, he refused to withdraw uh, and left the police and uh, took up employment with an organization called Global Open. Uh, where he continued to uh, maintain the same identity, uh, collect the same information uh, and more, um, and pass it on to his corporate bosses uh, rather than his policing ones. Um, and, and to be clear, Mark, this Mark medley Kennedy... didn't have the same level of backup. Mm. So they were able to... Uh, so the activists around him, he, he was a bit more sloppy. Uh, his then-girlfriend, or the woman who she thought that was his, he was her boyfriend, um, found his uh, real uh, passport. Uh, right. This set up a sequence of events that led to him being confronted um, and him uh, admitting uh, to uh, his status as a police officer. Well, it's interesting because the way that it was reported, as, as I remember anyway, was basically this guy had a bit of a crisis of conscience and decided to come clean. But it sounds more like he just screwed up and was eventually yeah. exposed. Yeah. And... I mean, he um, he employed the publicist Mix Clifford in the immediate aftermath mm. of being exposed. I mean, obviously, he didn't have that police backup. Right. So, um, you know, the, uh, the the police line was like, we can neither, neither confirm nor deny. Neither yeah, confirm yeah, nor yeah, deny. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, then they started to one bad apple because, I mean, essentially, um, you know, Mark Kennedy was infiltrating the environmental direct action movement. Um, he was living in a communal house. Uh, he was... Uh, he had a polyamorous lifestyle. Um, so he was in a serious long-term relationship with... Uh, two different women or uh, well, three women during his deployment, but also had numerous sexual relationships with a large number of other women. Um, and there was a lot of quite sordid uh, detail around that, which dominated the media coverage, which, I mean, you know, British media is obviously very interested in, in sex it, itself. Of course. So, uh, I mean, that was how a lot of the, um, the coverage of it w went. And Max Clifford obviously, you know, kind of uh, directed uh, Mark Kennedy to do, there was a channel four documentary, which was, Right. I mean, the best, I mean, I, do, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but there is a scene in it where he cries, which I, I would recommend that section. Yeah, maybe, but... still, maybe, maybe we'll just cut that part and we'll just pop it into the podcast at this point, <laughs> yeah. the uh, the video episode. Anyway, um, I mean, I mean, look, absolutely, the the lurid details were plastered all over the press, but I remember mm. thinking at the time, God, imagine how traumatic it must be, because I don't think this was the case with Kennedy. I can't remember, but certainly some of the people who. Uh, were were surveilled, had children with mm. the officers who were spying on them. Your entire life is a lie. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A, a person that you thought you knew, a person that, that you loved, that you trusted, who was the father of your kid, turns out they were sent by the state to, mm. as a part of a campaign to repress and investigate left-wing groups. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, the, the, these men had a huge amount of backup um, for... What they were doing, they knew everything about these women, so they were able to present themselves as being like the perfect boyfriend. Of um, th they never forgot a birthday or an anniversary or anything. Yeah, they had <laughs> you know, because... a ledger somewhere with everything in it. <laughs> right. They, I mean, they they literally had a handler whose job it was to make sure that they were up to date with all that kind of stuff. Um, they had access to everybody's like personal histories, their medical records. You know, they were able to. I mean, what, what was really common? A lot of these. I mean. A lot of these uh, these officers' relationships, the way they uh, interacted with the women, something really similar about it. Uh, they, mm. It appears like they were that they had some like set letters that they would use to send. You know, pretty much just change the name at the top, change the name at the bottom. There you go, send. There's your. Uh, uh, yeah. There's your, it was particularly for with the withdrawal. Um, you know, it was a really yeah. kind of key element of. Um, we talk about like the way that the 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 undercover cops kind of like used like gossip and trauma you know, mm -hmm. in equal measure, you know, they, they use gossip a lot to like kind of navigate and they use trauma 
in a lot of different ways, particularly for their withdrawal, but also for their way they kind of got close to people. Right. Um, and they would always, they would always, it was very common for them to have some personal private trauma, which they were going to like kind of share with a very limited number of people in order to kind of build those bonds of trust. Yeah, this and often those things Car of trauma Carlo, would be actually. the same trauma that like the woman who that they were targeting had experienced. So mm. they had a real link because, you know, they'd also lived through the, the slow death of a, of a parent, which yeah, sure. the woman that they were dating was going through at that time. Then, you know, they would be there, they were very close to you in the funeral and all that kind of stuff, really building very strong bonds with people uh, in very short periods of time. Oh, hey, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, this was the case with Carlo, I think, as mm. well. He he had, I don't know, something, a parent who died or something like this. And mm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about something else. Uh, we, we've been talking about the organizations, the types of organizations that were under surveillance. But as far as I understand, a, a, a full list has never been published, e even mm. through the inquiry. But, um, I mean, the, from, from the point of view of the official justification of the state, you could say, okay, some of these organizations... Uh, were subversive organizations, mm -hmm. I don't know, involved in direct action of some sort mm -hmm. or, or creating trouble, uh, as you said, public order incidents mm -hmm. or demonstrations. But there, there are other organizations that really, that there's no uh, rational justification from the mm -hmm. point of view of, of the official story of the capitalist mm -hmm. state, like, I don't know, the anti-apartheid movement, uh, mm -hmm. CND, I read mm -hmm. a report about CN, uh, 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 an officer mm -hmm. who was infiltrating the CND in West London, and he felt a bit uh, uncomfortable infiltrating this, uh, these ladies who met for tea in the, in the, in the front room or something like this. Um, what, I mean, in the, in, in the context of the inquiry, what justification has been given for the infiltration of groups of, of this kind? Obviously, we are in, against the infiltration of any, any groups mm -hmm. in reality, but from the point of view of the official story given mm -hmm. for these uh, deployments. I mean, they flounder. I mean, you get... Um... That, that question is put to the undercover officers who infiltrate those kind of groups. Uh, I mean, they flounder. A lot of them talk about the potentiality. Um, they point to the size of the demonstrations that CND were organizing um, and that they would they, they needed to know. Um, but also there's, there, there is like a, just a fantastical thing with it. You know what I mean? They, they come up with some right nonsense. Like, oh, you might think they're like that, but they're not really, you know I mean? You, you, you get that from some former undercover officers. Um, I've also, I've also read some of the reports and they, they seem very mundane, you know, like uh, so-and-so from the Hackney branch of the SWP is now going out with so-and-so from the Tottenham branch or I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've seen a report of a, of a meeting by Workers' Power at Conway Hall and I'm thinking, I've been to many meetings at Conway Hall, you know, and, and this officer says, okay, well, then the Spartacist League came in and they were, in, they were prevented from speaking. It's just really silly reports. Is, isn't that a case uh, or an element that the Special Demonstration Squad started these deployments and then it kind of took a life of, of its own that they had to justify uh, the continuation of this from which they got wages and obviously I'm, I'm guessing overtime and, and payment, mm. just, just to try to justify the continuation of these deployments when uh, uh, it, it didn't really serve much of a useful purpose for, for the state, perhaps. Before Tom comes back I mean, on that, just, just, just quickly, uh, because, and I, I want to hear what you have to say on that, but that reminds me of something that I read in the first tranche of the um, findings of the inquiry, which only goes up to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And the top line is, is essentially exactly that. They're offering nothing useful, nothing mm -hmm. that's materially useful to security, to the maintenance of law and order is coming out of this unit. Mm -hmm. It should have been wrapped up before well before it actually was. The interim report suggests that the unit should have been uh, uh, shut after the October demonstration of the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign uh, mm -hmm. in the first year. You know, it, it shouldn't have lasted a full year. I mean, that's that's a John Mitting's uh, assertion. Absolutely, it took on a life of its own. Um, I would take issue, though, with the idea that it's not useful to the state, because, as you say, by their own sort of means, you know, they're not fulfilling their terms of reference of, you know, preventing public disorder and uh, countering subversion. But 
the, the, to, to, to my way of looking at it, the, the, the two big issues, the two big things that they are use, always useful for the state for is building these lists for vetting, for blacklisting, to mm. prevent people getting into places of influence within British society so that we have this, we, we continue this rightward skewing of all aspects of public life in Britain. And, and secondly, it's about disruption and undermining. I mean, the vast majority of the groups that these undercover officers infiltrated fell apart eventually, um, either because of the covert policing or other overt policing methods. Um, we know that the just from the overt policing, we know that the police are willing to go to great lengths to intimidate and bully people out of taking part in political action. Sometimes that takes the you know, place of just you know, beating people up on demonstrations and things, which has happened many times over the years, and stops people from wanting to go to demonstrations, or just the intimidating atmosphere they create. But the, the existence of these undercover officers in the group goes beyond what's in the reports. Um, it's about the role they played within those groups, uh, which was often very, very disruptive. Um, often, like, it not necessarily immediately uh, obvious that they were the ones being disruptive. Or often it was other people you would think were being disruptive. But the atmosphere they created, the, the, the little things they did, had a huge impact on the success of those groups going forward, you know? Mm. I want to take us forward to the beginning of the inquiry, because mm. it was launched under a Tory administration. I believe <laughs> yeah. it was called by Theresa May in 2015. Yeah, it was, yeah. 2015. What was, and assuming we don't have to persuade each other that the Tory government didn't have the best interests <laughs> of the public at heart, they weren't launching this because they actually cared about justice for the victims. Mm. So what was the motivation of the British state in beginning the inquiry at this time? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think like um, there was something about the... You know, when the Lawrence, it, it turned out the Lawrence family campaign was infiltrated, uh, that, that gave another another layer of um, weight uh, to the demands of people who've been affected, well, the victims of the spy cops. Um, I mean, their box office. I mean, and certainly Theresa May announced the inquiry after she came out of a meeting with Doreen Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't believe it was because of that either. I mean, what was also happening at the time, um, I mean, you may remember that uh, she was the first Home Secretary to get booed at a police federation conference. Um, they would, you know, austerity was a few years in by this point. Um, they were coming, they, they'd come for every other department. They hadn't come for the police's wages yet. So, I mean, there's a, there's been a big change. I mean, there has, has, over the last nine years, there has been a change in the way in which uh, police are much more likely to get kicked off their jobs now. I mean, there was a time where you were pretty much, you would have to drop a very serious bollock in order to lose your job as a cop. That's um, technical term now we for see those uh, um, listeners who aren't in the UK, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the um, yeah. The the, the we see you know, huge numbers of police on trial for rape you know, over the last year or so. You know, since Wayne Cousin stuff came out, we've they've actually started the, the great noticing has become uh, has begun of the huge the industrial levels of sexual abuse that the British police take our part in. Um, and I, I think you know during that time period, you know, there was a number of uh, public inquiries called. Um, I think it was an instrument. I think. I think the state kind of likes it because at the end of the day, it is about kicking it into the long grass. You know, um, these these processes take an incredibly large amount of time. And we just had the Grenfell inquiry report. That was seven years. I mean, we're into year nine of the undercover policing inquiry. It's meant to report by December 2026. Um, who knows? It the I'd be surprised if it finishes by then, if it does the job properly. I mean, we spent majority of the time of this inquiry uh, working on secrecy. Um, the... The numerous uh, applications for secrecy from former undercover officers demanding their privacy, saying that you know that they have a right to a, a private family life, which is incredibly gross considering what they've done, yeah. uh, which you know the the, the inquiry is acquiesced to. I mean that that's taken the majority of the time of the time the inquiry has been sitting. It's only the last really the last couple of years we've actually looked at the actual detail, um, and we're now just starting to get towards the more modern era, uh, and things are now being done in a rush. Um, and I, I think, you know, when, 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 you know, the likes of Theresa May calls public inquiries, she's just, she's taking it off her desk at the end of the day, right? You know, just passing it on to someone else to deal with. And I mean, it, it is quite, I mean, I, I never believed we would get this level of disclosure about this, you know, about this, these units and what the cops were actually up to. And it is very illuminating, but it is very historic. Um, as we get closer, there's, there's more and more secrecy. Um, the inquiries, you know, terms of reference end in uh, 2010, I think uh, it's, you know, I mean, I think as much as it was like a shock that they called this, I, I don't think it does any great harm to the British state, the fact that it exists necessarily. Mm -hmm. So we have a new government, the mm. glorious Labour administration of mm. Sir Keir Starmer, Knight of the Realm. 
And the um, headline message from Labour has been, this is this is change. You've had 13 years of the Tories and now everything's going to change. Mm. And they've gone on to announce policies, including freezing pensioners to death in their homes over Christmas and basically maintaining um, an austerity agenda and maintaining the British state support for genocide abroad and imperialist wars um, throughout the world. So not very much has changed. And on the question of spy cops, it was notable to me that there was a bill, the so-called spy cops mm. bill, um, mm. that was voted on in 2021, but all mm. the way back to 2020, mm. uh, Keir Starmer, then in opposition, indicated that he was going to whip Labour MPs to abstain. They abstained on all the readings. They abstained um, in the Lords and eventually went through. There was an attempt by, I think, Chakrabarti to put in some sort of amendment or to introduce some clauses that would prevent um, officers from getting immunity um, for committing crimes, basically, in the course of their surveillance. Mm. And that was also shot down when Labour abstained. So it's very clear that Keir Starmer, who we should also say in another life, was Director of Public Prosecutions. So mm. when it comes to the activities of the British state in conducting these sorts of um, the, the, these sorts of practices, this sort of repression, um, he's got a bit of historic skin in the game. But it doesn't seem likely, given that, um, that we're going to see these sorts of practices abandoned in the future. I mean, one of the arguments the Labour used, in fact, when they abstained was that this bill would provide a proper legal framework for this special kind of policing. So mm. what do you think about the current government's attitude towards uh, practices like using undercover surveillance to target and intimidate and attack left-wing groups, trade unionists, and mm. um, potentially to pass on that information to the bosses? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the um, the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Criminal Conduct Act is a terrifying piece of legislation. Um, the fact that uh, Starmer whipped the party to abstain on it, um, I mean, I think he would have whipped to vote for it, to be perfectly honest, if he was if he was being honest about where his politics lie. He's a prosecutor, as you said, and if you elect a prosecutor, uh, expect prosecution. Um, I don't think... Um, there's something worse, I think, in a way. I think there's something worse about the when the Labour Party is repressive in this way because the Tories just, you know, you kind of you kind of expect it from them. Um, you mm. know, we're uh, they view you know working class people as scum, and you know, no wonder they want to that they're all for there being the repression of autonomous political movements from the working classes. Um, Labour are met, <laughs> purport to be something else. Um, I think we all know they're not. Um, but I think, you know, particularly when you consider how many um, currently serving um, Labour MPs uh, and members of the House of Lords were spied on by the, these undercover officers, um, mm -hmm. the personal connections many uh, elected representatives within the Labour Party have with those who are even worse uh, kind of uh, affected by the deployments. Um, it just shows, you know, a level... The level of cruelty, I guess, we, we, we should we should come to expect as a hallmark of Starmer's premiership, really. Um, the yeah, the the the, the Chis Act um, provides a framework for agents of the state, which includes police officers, but also can include any kind of uh, informant, really, uh, anybody who's designated as an agent, which generally means career criminals. Um, I mean, there's some horrific examples of the use of criminal um, criminals to by uh, police in order to crack supposed get, get to supposed other criminals but in the course of which doing just some horrific activity it legalizes murder it legalizes rape um it legalizes any any form of criminality uh, providing it's the use of you know unregulated no oversight uh, private contractors uh, who are you know employed by the police under the auspices of this act to behave in the most horrific ways possible in order to gain intelligence to to put onto databases to put into the registry files. Mm. I mean, what, what, one of the reasons why there hasn't been enough fuss about the 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 revelations that have come out of the inquiry is that the current political situation for protest is objectively worse. Um, we've got people being sent to prison for five years for taking part in a Zoom meeting where they plan to hang some banners off the the, the yeah. over a motorway.
the, you know, the, the preventative arrests that take place, but you know, um, before the King's speech by the um, Palestine Solidarity activists, yes. you know, these kind of things objectively were. I mean, there's a long history of preventative arrests for royal related events. Don't get me wrong, um, but across the board, you know, the police, you know, it's illegal to, to the, you know, the the um, the other the crime uh, the crime and sentencing bill. You know, the most leg the most draconian legislation we've ever had on the books exists mm. right now. Um, it's going to get worse. And I want to talk to uh, Jorge about this, actually, because we've released a lot of articles on Marxist.com recently about the increasingly repressive nature of the state uh, in the so-called advanced democratic capitalist countries, and also just the shameless hypocrisy of the politicians in these countries who will make a big song and dance about how they stand for um, you know, democratic principles of freedom of speech and assembly, that they're a Western order standing up against repressive regimes abroad, like the Putin regime in Russia. And yet you saw kids getting their heads kicked in by police all over the USA, uh, arrested and, and attacked in Britain as well. Not only that, but leaning on Zionist thugs in many instances in order to break up the lines, to break up the encampments. These were kids who were standing up in opposition to their governments facilitating a genocide abroad. I mean, I can't think of a better use of freedom of speech if the institution has any value at all, uh, other than perhaps agitation for revolution, of course. And they were beaten up by the police and Zionist goons who they were collaborating with. So... Um, what do we say, uh, Jorge, as communists, as Marxists, about the increasingly repressive nature of the state in this period? And why is it getting worse? I, I will say that one turning point in all of this has been the Palestine uh, protest. Definitely in the last few, few months or the last ne nearly a year now, there's been a complete assault on, uh, on freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of protest in a whole number of countries. In France, at the beginning, they wanted to ban all demonstrations in solidarity with uh, Gaza. In uh, Germany, there's been heavy-handed uh, policing of any, any attempt to demonstrate in solidarity with Gaza. In Austria, some of our own comrades have been investigated by the state prosecutor on, on issues of national security for raising the slogan of Intifada until victory. So it just shows you how... I will say in this particular case, it shows you how important is for imperialist powers <clears throat> their support to Israel. This question of Israel, the support for imperialism abroad and so on, is, is a crucial question for them. And I think that this goes a little bit to answer uh, a question about the spy corps in, inquiry, because you, you may you may ask well, why why were they investigating the anti-apartheid movement or the troops out uh, movement? Well, there's a the very good reason. It's not that these people were causing public order uh, problems or that they were subversives in any in any serious way, but rather that that they were subversives in as much as they were undermining or attacking one of the pillars of British imperialism, which which was support for troops in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, support for the apartheid regime in South Africa, and and so on. So I think that this is an important uh, question that to, to draw from all of this. Anyone, however democratic the ways that you use within the framework of, of the limits of bourgeois democracy, even if you, you attempt to have a, a legal demonstration, if, if they think that this legal demonstration is going against a fundamental pillar of, of, the, of the system, in this case imperialism, they will try to prevent it. And then if the law doesn't allow them to do so, they, they'll change the law right. and they'll make the law more repressive in order to, to have a... So they will use legal and illegal uh, means to try to, uh, to, try to prevent uh, from serious organizing and, and, uh, and influencing public opinion and, and so on on issues that they, they, they think are, are crucial for them. Do you think another part of it also is that the crisis of capitalism is intensifying? We're deep into the so-called cost of living crisis. Um, there's been an uptick in, in protest, in trade union activity in the last period. There's more crisis on the horizon. The capitalists know this. Starmer and co. know they have to carry out austerity in order to rebalance the books, as they would put it, in order to basically protect the boss's profits at the expense of all of us. When the Crime and Sentencing Act was passed, it felt very clear to me that this was basically future-proofing 
by the capitalists, yeah, by, by, by the British the, states. The they were preparing for the battles of the future. They were sharpening the state's weapons because they anticipate more pushback, more um, class struggle in the future. Yeah, I will say that's the case. And not, not only in Britain, it's, it's an international uh, phenomenon. Uh, not, not only the rise of right-wing populism, but the, but the strengthening of the power of the state to intervene, to, to the, as you say, sharpening their the tools. Uh, incidentally, in, in Spain, in the last two or three years, there has been a number of revelations about spy corps, uh, uh, police officers infiltrating left-wing social movements, and many of them also establishing pers long-term personal intimate mm -hmm. sexual relationships with the people they were investigating. So I think that in, in Spain, people will be looking at what's coming out of this uh, inquiry. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently visited, uh, last year, I visited Barcelona and met with a number of the people who've been affected by the deployment of undercover officers in Spain. I mean, I would say, um, if anything, it's much worse. Um, you know, in, in the UK, we had these undercover officers uh, who were sent into, uh, they were, you know, they were, they, they'd been policemen for many years. They were sent in to uh to radical groups they were in their 30s they were always married you had to be married with children in order to be deployed um in spain they're sending in um graduates straight out of police college yes. um straight i mean in some cases these people are having their first serious relationship and it's a deployment um they're they're living full time uh the, the british undercover cops would would kind of would go home they would go home in between they would have time on shift time out um you were saying earlier about how well you know with the overtime and stuff these you know the the british sds officers were some of the most well paid uh police officers in britain because they were they were getting overtime for sleeping up until the late 80s when they changed the rules yeah but i mean in in spain these officers are living full time in their identities completely full time i mean the, the maria who um uh, infiltrated uh, uh, got into a long term uh, intimate relationship with a member of a uh, radical um, catalan uh, republican group um you know, she lived with him for three years. She had the same Instagram that she'd had as a teenager uh, as her Instagram when she was un deployed undercover. And since she's been exposed, um, she still uses it now. <laughs> I mean, the, the 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 blurred lines between her personal life and her as a as an undercover officer just seem completely completely uh, blurred. Um, you know, the 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 number of these officers they were using like uh, social dating apps. They were using like OK Cupid uh, to, and I mean, you can plot the relationships that one officer was having. He just basically was trying to have one with every anarch an anarchist in every area of Barcelona, um, a real industrial scale. Um, and yeah, incredibly horrific using the same sort of, uh, a lot of the same tactics. Um, I mean, we've just, what is particularly scary is they've just unmasked another uh, undercover officer uh, who was deployed into, uh, in Madrid, um, and she was undeployed for over 20 years which, again, another scale to what we've seen in the UK. She, and there's a lot more to come. A, there's a lot a, more to come. She was deployed in a group that was uh, relatives of uh, mm. people who've been in, in prison, people who've been uh, harassed by the police and so on. And she pretended to be a, a middle-aged mom as well, also mm. Mm. looking after the, the children and stuff like that. And she was, yeah, she was involved for 20 yeah. years. And now that she's been uncovered in her social media, she's come out, as a, as a far-right activist, uh, putting forward far-right uh, ideas and, and so on, which which you obviously had all, all along, as well as being a police uh, officer. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You see capitalist states throughout the world utilizing the same sorts of methods. Yeah. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion, and mm -hmm. I hate to bring it to a close, but I did want to ask Tom, what do you see coming out of this, if anything? I mean, I think when we see... I mean, I, 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 strangely, you'll be shocked to hear I don't really believe in British justice. No way. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not yeah. expecting. I mean, I think the most we could have ever expected from the final report, I was covered in the interim report. You know, the unit should have been shut down in its early days. I mean, like, yeah, great. That, you know, that that's as much as they're ever going to give us. Um, I think the the the, the things we learn from it um are come from disclosure. And it comes not just from the individual detail, but also the bigger picture of looking at all the stuff that they've released. It's it's about knowing what they're after, and I think you know it's it's important to us as political activists to to learn the lessons. And I think there's two major lessons that we need to learn. I mean, one is about the way in which that they that they're after the lists. You know, they're building lists. It's about the vetting, uh, and but about being cute about how we we deal with that. 
but I mean, secondly, I think uh, what's really important is is countering the the way they used gossip and the way that they kind of created internal infighting within groups. I mean, the last set of humans we heard about a fourth child born um, from. Uh, the undercover deployments. I mean, I think it's it's a, it's definitely um, a worthwhile endeavor to follow the, the the hearings. I mean, I I would say that I've been doing it for, for, since the beginning, and before that, I was doing civil cases. I've been I've been covering this topic for fourteen years now, but um, I think that the inquiry itself is is a is, is a shambles. But uh, um, it's it's massively over budget. It's massively uh, behind schedule. Um, it's doing everything in a rush. Um, there will be, uh, you know, the, the next set of hearings is due to start in three weeks' time. We've only got the timetable for the first week because they haven't finalised the rest of the hearings. Um, yeah. Because it's the 30th of September, is that correct? Yeah, first. Um, so it starts with a week of opening statements. Um, and then uh, from the, the week of the 7th of October, we'll start hearing from undercover officers. Um, we'll be hearing from HN122, Neil Richardson, who infiltrated um, Class War. Uh, which I was a member of, uh, and the Revolutionary Communist Party. Um, we'll be hearing from a number of people who were uh, targeted by him, and then we'll be hearing from people uh, who were targeted by Bob, Bob Lambert, who will be giving evidence a bit later on. Um, Bob Lambert, one of the most senior members of the of the, of the unit, went on to lead the unit, uh, wrote the Tradecraft Manual, or an early version of it, um, had four relationships whilst deployed, including fathering one child. Uh, he went on to set up the Muslim um, contact unit, uh, became an academic, um, was one of the authors of the Prevent Strategy. People are aware of that, which is yep. that's the de-radicalization of Muslims. Um, the, 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 there's an unbroken line, really, in his career. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the officers um, who... Who were deployed around the same time went on to the same things as him. I mean, a lot of them won't be giving evidence because they've left the country. John Dines um, is teaching police ethics in Australia. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the most uh, appalling, appalling human beings. I mean, we will get to see his his statements. The inquiry will be read out. Um, you yeah, know, just horrific. Uh, he was in a long term relationship with uh, Helen Steele, who was one of the McLeibel too. Um, to be honest, if, if, if his classes are just a case of if you do the exact opposite of everything I've done in the course of my career, then uh, it'll be the closest possible thing to ethical policing. Right. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. That, I mean, uh, what what's more chilling is that it's not going to be that, is it? It's no. going to be like how to get away with doing the most terrible, terrible yeah. things. Of course. Uh, and, I mean, we see that you know, a number of the um, we heard from Trevor Morris, the last set of hearings. I mean, he set up special ba branch Baghdad. Um you know, I mean, there's there, there's photos of them with what appear to be death squads in all sorts of theatres around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, these these officers went on to have very very successful careers in the security industries as well as in the, within the police and security services. Uh, some of them ended up at MI6, some of them ended up in Qatar and all, all around the world. Um, you know, uh, directing how other police forces operate. Um, yeah, I mean, just exposing that, I think, is, is worthwhile. I don't think we're going to get any satisfaction. I don't think the end of the inquiry will mean the end of anything, really. Um, you know, I remember before we had the inquiry called, we were, you know, as activists, we were meeting about it, and we had a little conference thing, and we had some people come over from the Pat Fanukan Centre in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland uh, who had worked quite heavily on the Bloody Sunday um, inquiries uh, following that. You know, people have been affected by it. And, I mean, they said the best thing that came out of a public inquiry for you is another public inquiry, and the best thing that came out of that is another public inquiry. And when you're about three or four public inquiries in, you might start getting to some serious truth. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't think that's... I don't know if that's going to be the case with this. Um, I, there's a danger that it just wraps, gets wrapped up really early and they just speed walk through the last bit. Um, the judge says, the chair says he's heard enough. And, you know, we don't get to get that level of detail out of the, the later witnesses, which I th is a great fear, I think, for anybody who's following the inquiry closely. Well, it re puts me in mind of something that I read that you said fairly recently, which is that anybody these days who truly wants to change the world for the better must be a revolutionary. Mm. And that resonated with something that we say a lot on Marxist.com, something that we believe is communists, something that Marx and Engels discovered off the back of particularly their experiences observing the Paris Commune, that you actually can't reform the British state. You can't reform any bourgeois state. It's an institution, it's an apparatus designed to represent and to enforce the interests of the economically dominant class. All you can do is smash it. You can smash it up. 
No, I, I wanted to say back back about the inquiry. What, what's going to come out of this? I, I, I share your your view that uh, not much is going to come out of it. It's, it's not designed to to do anything like that. It's just just designed to fob off people. Say, okay, there's an inquiry. Blah blah blah. We're going to talk about this. But I, I I'd say that is is not necessarily the case that it's completely useless because the fact that there is an inquiry, some some information is coming out. And I think that we as, as revolutionaries should use this, not, not to say, okay, we knew about this already. What did you expect from the state? Yeah, because we, we know, but uh, the, the, the point is to use some of this really scandalous information that's coming out in order to make the, this, this uh, message known to a wider layer of people who are not necessarily uh, aware, to make them aware of, of, of what is the character of the capitalist state and how it acts. And now we have lots of concrete examples that are particularly scandalous to, that we can explain to, to people. So I think that it's just, yeah, that's, that's the main conclusion from, from, from it, not, not what the inquiry will find or its final conclusions or recommendations, which will be probably whitewash, but uh, how we as revolutionaries can use the information that's been uh, glanced or, or bits of information that they have uh, released. Because I've also looked at some of these PDFs and, and, mm -hmm. and lots of them are heavily redacted, but, but you can get more mm -hmm. or less what they were doing. So some of the things they've been forced to reveal, to use them uh, uh, from the point of view of explaining to why, uh, why the public that might not be uh, aware or might not have an ex a direct experience of this, what is the capitalist state, how it operates and, and uh, why it cannot be reformed, basically. Mm -hmm. And hopefully mm -hmm. this podcast will contribute in a small way to making people aware. And also, if people want to get into the real nitty gritty and they want to obtain all the information coming out of this inquiry, which I agree with with Jorge, is it's valuable to see the dirty secrets of the mm. British state laid bare, then I really do recommend that you check out Tom's podcast, Spy Cops Info. Once again, I'll put a link in the description so that you can give it a listen. Very interesting, pretty harrowing. But um, how often do you publish, Tom? I mean, it's uh, how long's a piece of string? Uh, we were doing them weekly at one point. I mean, that's mm -hmm. fallen away a bit. There's quite a lot of episodes uh, recorded over the last couple of months because the inquiry's been on. So there's a bit of a backlog at the moment. So expect them quite regularly for the next few months. There'll probably be a big gap again then. Um, when the inquiry's sitting, I, I I live tweet everything that's happening as it happens. And then in the breaks, I do live video. So if anybody wanna, wants to follow that, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, or if, there's a Facebook group, Spy Cops Info Facebook group, where we put the videos. Um, the pretty much any social media, just look for the hashtag Spy Cops and you'll, you'll find stuff as it's coming out. Fantastic. Well, I'll put information um, to that effect in the description as well. And as was said, um, we are revolutionaries. We're trying to build a revolutionary organization that can actually achieve justice for all the victims of all forms of state repression. And uh, that's what the Revolutionary Communist Party in Britain, not the same one that Tom mentioned, that was an older outfit with the same name, that's our British organization, communist.red. Uh, that's what they are trying to build. They'll be carrying more coverage of the Spy Cops case, I'm sure, as the inquiry goes on. We'll carry it as well on marxist.com. Um, Tom, it's been really fantastic having you on. Great to be on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, always willing to talk about this. Um, you know, uh, there's... I mean, as, as Jorge was saying, you know, just then, it, it's really important, I think, for us to learn the lessons that we, we were able to glean from the inquiry um, as revolutionaries. Um, if we're going to have a confrontational social movement that's capable of having any serious change in this country, then we need to have a genuinely defensive position when it comes to the kind of repression that the, the state is going to mete out. So I think it falls as a responsibility to anybody who's involved in radical politics and particularly to any revolutionary to learn the lessons of what the state is willing to do and how far they're willing to go. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again for a new episode next week. See you soon. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.